Biblical creation best explains the origin of kinds. This is another reason why biblical creation is good science. The laws of genetics support biblical creation because adaptation, things like color change or size change, it does not lead to evolution. It doesn't lead to new kinds of creature. Adaptation is simply shuffling of existing genes. Adaptation or speciation involves no new information. So if you look at Darwin's finches, yes, they adapt by having a change in size of beak or uh, a, a more pointed beak or a sharp beak, but that is adaptation. That is not evolution. Biology books often quote this as an example of evolution, but it is not evolution. The peppered moth, the, the change in proportion of dark moths and light moths, that is not evolution. That is adaptation. Resistant bacteria, that is not evolution. That, again, is adaptation. I have five children. Two of them have blue eyes. Three of them have brown eyes. That doesn't mean they're beginning to evolve into different kinds of human beings. Uh, they may not be as frightening as me, but they're not changing into any other kind of creature. Adaptation is not evolution. I can give an illustration from engineering here. Uh, a range of cars is like adaptation. I work with Jaguar cars in the UK, and they have a wonderful range of cars, different sizes, different types, different colors. But that's just to suit different needs. Those cars are not evolving into another kind of technology, like aeroplanes. They're still cars. So adaptation is not evolution. But the laws of genetics with respect to gene mutations also support biblical creation. Gene mutations produce only a loss of genetic information. And there are no examples of gene mutations creating novel structures. Gene mutations cause only deformities or neutral uh, changes like the picture uh, is showing here. Again, I can illustrate this from engineering. A spacecraft may have 100,000 components. A random change to a dimension never improves the design. A random change results in a loss of information. On the screen is one of my favorite components. In fact, I have a in fact, I take this around with me, this uh, worm gear. It's at the heart of that solar array, so it's very close to my heart, and I take this around with me. This one component has about 100 units of information that specify it. You can see lots of the dimensions there up on the screen. If you were to change randomly one dimension on that shaft, it would probably be, be catastrophic for the spacecraft. It would not improve the spacecraft. It would not begin to evolve it into another kind of spacecraft. It would be catastrophic. If you were just about to get on an aeroplane and the maintenance engineer came up to you and said, I would just like to tell you, just for fun, I've randomly changed one of the components on all the jet engines. I have not got a clue what effect it's going to have, but I just did it for fun. Would you still get on that aeroplane? Would Bill Nye get on that aeroplane? Would Richard Dawkins get on that aeroplane? What would their faith in evolution be like? Random changes don't improve designs. Then there is positive evidence for creation. I've worked for many years on the human knee joint, and I've written uh, books and papers explaining how it is an irreducible knee joint. It cannot evolve step by step. It has a wonderful cam mechanism, the way the bones roll together. It also has a four-bar linkage mechanism inside, the way it guides the bones. Every mechanical engineer knows that a four-bar mechanism cannot evolve step by step. I've published this work in, in many secular journals. Uh, just last year, I published this in the American Society for Mechanical Engineers describing the intricacies of design of that knee joint. And that is evidence that we were created, we were not evolved. I've asked evolutionists to explain to me, how do you think the knee joint could evolve? One of the things they say to me is, 
uh, you need a degree to understand the four bar mechanism. How can, you explain, how can you expect me to explain how it could evolve? To which I say, well, if you don't understand the knee joint, how do you know that it could evolve? To which they sometimes say, I have faith that it could have evolved. I've also done work on peacock feathers and published this in journals like the Institute of Physics. Peacock feathers have an amazing beauty. They have bright optical colours, not colours due to pigment, but they have these precision thin film uh, layers that give structural interference. The layers of keratin on a peacock feather are so thin they are comparable to the wavelengths of coloured light. And those thicknesses are so incredibly precise that you get different colours across the peacock feather. You get iridescent colours that change with the angle of view, and you get a digital pattern. The segments are so tiny, and there are loose barbs and tight barbs, many wonderful, beautiful features in the peacock feather. Those beautiful features require vast information in the genetic code. And there isn't even a selective advantage. So here again is very positive evidence for biblical creation. I've asked evolutionists to tell me, how do you think this could evolve? And they said, how can I explain how that could evolve? I need a degree in physics to understand the intricacies of a peacock feather. To which I say, well, if you don't even understand the peacock feather, how can you believe that it evolved by chance. <laughs>